Hello everyone, I'm Cassie, Marketing Specialist from GemScript. Today's topic for the webinar session is Precision Mutant Library Helps in Protein Engineering. I'm very excited to introduce you to the presenter today, Dr. Edward Wong. He's the field application scientist in GemScript. He completed his PhD degree from University of Adelaide. He worked as a postdoctoral fellow at National Cancer Center Singapore for three years. During his time in NCC, he has successfully reported the predictive factors for genetic screening of BRCA1 and BRCA2. He also reported the importance of genetic testing for 25 breast cancer predisposition genes using NGS technology. Both of his works were reported in POS1 and NPJ Genomic Medicine. This webinar will take around 40 minutes. If you have any questions, please feel free to type in the questions field that you can see on your screen, and we'll be answering them after the presentation. If you didn't get to answer your question during the Q&A session, we'll be sure to take down and I'll email back to you. We'll record this webinar and it will be available on our website after today. We'll also be offering a 15% discount for our Precision Newton Library service for all attendees today. I will email you the details of this promotion after the session. So lastly, here's the list of the upcoming webinars that will be rolling out on the following weeks. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Edward to start his presentation. Dr. Edward, over to you right now. Well, thank you very much, Casey, for the kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be invited again on this webinar series and to introduce our new technology, which is the Precision Mutant Libraries. Uh, last week, we had Dr. Grace from uh, GenScript who gave a wonderful presentation about the antibody or protein engineering to give a perfect molecule. And during her presentation, she briefly touched on the precision mutant library. And today I will further elaborate and share with you the information about uh, the precision mutant library. And at the end of the presentation, uh, you will understand about uh, this technology and how you can utilize this technology uh, in order to help in your work. So let me guide you through to the uh, content that I want to present today. First, I will briefly introduce about the relationship between the synthetic biology and the protein engineering, followed by introductions of our in-house technology, which is the semiconductor-based technology for DNA synthesis, and how we utilize this technology to construct the precision mutant library. And lastly, I will sh show you a couple of uh, case studies to let you to have an idea how you can utilize this technology in your work. So uh, the synthetic biology can be defined in many ways. When I look for the information, I came across an article that published in the Chemical and Engineering News in the year of 2000. Well, the synthetic biology can be defined as the use of the synthetic capability of organic and biological chemistry to design the non-natural synthetic molecules that has the function in biological system. As the time goes on, uh, the definition of the synthetic biology has broadened, which is shown here, the design and construction of a new biological parts, devices, and systems. And those parts, devices, and systems are really those words that come from the engineering. So one of the ways that we also think that the synthetic biology can be used to redesign of existing natural biological system for useful purpose. And that is for the specific application. So here are, the uh, here are some of the engineering principles. So by design, for an example, uh, we need to build this machine to have a specific function. And I know how to draw the way to get there. And the modeling uh, is all about the mathematics. And that means that we can write an equations that actually to support the design. The characterizations uh, is really means about the practice of going through the design and to the way to where you build it, and then you test it. And through the process of testing, you characterize the system as a whole, as well as the individual part. And the abstractions means actually being uh, able to take now a larger view and if I go back to the definition that I mentioned of the, the parts and the devices, 
it means that not always looking at the specific level of details, but knowing that I, if I want a bigger uh, function, I can encode in a simple way. So the key technology for synthetic biology of all of this is a DNA synthesis. Well, this, uh, hang on. Okay, this cartoon here shows the engineering begins by defining the sequence in the natural host and the reconstruct of those to become the synthetic DNA. And then now you can have this piece of DNA to give you a function of interest in order to convert the input into a wide variety of the outputs that you want. Or you may string all of these devices together that one has one function and another one has another different functions and compile all of those to give you a features or structure uh, that you're interested in. So here are the products that produce using the protein engineering approach, including the beer and wine, the bread, the yogurt, uh, the pharmaceutical items, including the antibiotics, the hormones, the anti-cancer drugs. And also they start to use the protein engineering to produce the fuels and the chemicals that include the bioethanol and the citric acid and so on. So, how, the, uh, how can the metabolic engineering to improve the natural producer? So when I look for the information, I came across this picture as an analogy that best describes about the metabolic engineering. So what you see here is a maze and the mouse is trying to figure a way out to get to the destinations for the cheese. So we know that there are a number of routes that the mouse can use in order to achieve the destination but not all the roots are productive. So in the field of metabolic engineering, what you need to do is to, uh, to, uh, to remove those non-productive roots. And by, by what that means is through eliminating those non-productive roots in order to avoid the accumulation of the second metabolites and uh, the productions of the byproducts. Alternatively, you can also overexpress the enzymes of the limiting reaction steps or to improve the enzymes through the protein engineering in order to stimulate or motivate the production rate. So I would like to show a picture of a cat that chasing a mouse. So the cat uh, plays like a modified enzymes to chase the mouse and to make the mouse run faster in order to get to the destination. Of course, uh, we know that it is always not so straightforward to synthesize an enzyme to give you the function of interest. Similar to the engineering principle, as I mentioned, it needs to go through a cycle of three different steps. Uh, the step one is to design the prototype. And here it will be using the DNA as a template, followed by the second step, which is to construct a library of variants. And then the third step involves the testing of this variance in order to select the variance to give you uh, the, uh, the improvement in the performance. However, the bottlenecks occurs during the build stage because it is very time consuming and costly to build a large library for, of variance at the same time. In order to overcome this, the GenScript offers an array of the services to help the researchers, including the DNA fragments, gene synthesis, gene variant libraries, as well as the CRISPR services and products. And today I will be talking about the gene variance libraries. So there are two different types of the gene variant libraries that offer by GenScript, the combined natural DNA assembly, as well as the precision mutant libraries. And today I'll be focusing on talking about the precision mutant libraries and I will uh, introduce about a combined natural DNA assembly in the next webinar in the future. So before we talk about how the, um, the precision mutant library can help in the protein engineering, um, we should understand what proteins are. And I believe that many of you are more familiar than I do, but I will still like to take this opportunity to recapitulate the definition of the proteins. So proteins are a long chain molecules that made of a string of the amino acids that join together. There are 20 common amino acids 
and all of the pro, uh, different proteins are made from these amino acids. In fact, there are more than 500 amino acids that have been found in the nature. However, the human genetic code only directly encodes these 20 amino acids. So the essential amino acids must be obtained from the diet, whereas uh, non-essential amino acids can be synthesized through in the body. All of the amino acids are the compounds with a similar structure. Uh, they have a central carbon, an amino group, a carboxyl group, and a side chain or R group that attach to each of uh, the in, uh, amino acid. Additionally, depending on these side chains or the R groups that attach to the amino acid, each of the individual's amino acids possess a different properties. Some are hydrophobic, some are aromatic, some are acidic, and so on. So the amino acids are connected together by the amide bond, which is known as the peptide bond. It is formed between an alpha amino group of one amino acid and a carboxyl group of another in a condensation reaction. And the water is lost in the course of creating the peptide bond. So the proteins are the macro molecule and the most varied class of biological molecules. It consists of a great variety of the structure, which can be discussed in four different levels of increasing complexity. They're ranging from primary level to the quaternary level. The primary structure is simply the, um, the sequence of residues, making up the long chain of the polypeptide. Additionally, this, uh, this polypeptide is the blocking unit to build a protein. Therefore, the primary structure involves only the covalent bonds that linking the residues together. The secondary level of structure describes the local folding of the polypeptide backbone that is stabilizing by the hydrogen bond between the amino group and the carboxyl group. The commonly seen second structure are alpha helix and beta sheets. The tertiary structure describes how regions of the secondary structures that fold together that is uh, the 3D arrangement of a polypeptide chain, including several beta helixes, uh, several alpha helixes, beta sheets, and uh, any other loops. The quaternary structure describes a number of an arrangement of the individual polypeptide chains, holding together by the same force and bonds in a stable complex to form the, uh, the complete protein. And the function of a protein is determined by its shape. So what do proteins do? Here I show you a couple of an examples. The antibody, uh, which, is, uh, which are made of white blood cells, can protect us from the disease. And the hormones are proteins that regulate the biological processes, such as the muscle growth, uh, the feeling of hunger, the increase or decrease of the heart rate. Um, the enzymes, which is also a biological catalyst that found inside our body, are proteins as well. The transcription factors that involve in the cell growth, as well as you know, the proteins can also be used as a substance that cross the cell membrane in an active transport. For example, to absorb the glucose in the small intestine. So from here, you can see just how important the proteins are to us. Right, so how does our body build the proteins from the amino acid? So it really comes back down to the uh, DNA. The DNA is the blueprint for the proteins. Uh, it is like an instruction manual to build every beautiful protein structure in the living cells. And each gene is the code uh, for one protein of polypeptide. And the genes are expressed through an intermediate molecule known as the mRNA. So how does the protein synthesis work? On the right-hand side, I show you a simplified diagram to demonstrate the wonderful clever little system of protein synthesis. So in brief, uh, the double-stranded DNA is unzipped by the DNA helicase, allowing the ribonucleotides to bond to temporarily uh, with the nucleotide bases, forming a parallel chain of mRNA through the process known as the transcription, and with the sequence essentially reversed. It is then moved out for, uh, from the nucleus to the cytoplasm and best fit into the ribosome, which is known as the protein-making machine of the cell. 
another type of the RNA called the tRNA, which is the transfer RNA, that is made of three ribonucleotides that attach to an amino acid. And these tRNAs bind to the opposing complementary sequence, and the amino acid that attach will bind to the subsequent amino acid on the next tRNA that bound to mRNA. So this process uh, is known as the translation. So, and finally, uh, when the translation happens in the cell proteins, uh, it will fold into a unique 3D structure, which is determined by its amino acid sequence. So in the nature, uh, the enzymes exert their best biological activities in their living system as a result of a long-term natural evolution. With the understanding of the proteins and the advance in the technology, some of the enzymes have been rendered to become a practical alternative to traditional chemical catalysis. And these enzymes have the advantages in the aspect of the catalytic efficiency, the substrate specificity, as well as the environmental friendly. But the poor stability of these enzymes in a harsh industrial condition, including the high temperature, presence of protein denaturants, and the organic solvents have hindered the widespread use of its application. And this poses the challenges to the researchers or the protein engineers that how can we stabilize these enzymes so that it can have a broad range of catalytic function. And second, how do we create an enzyme uh, catalyst for reaction that is not known in the nature? So uh, now that's kind of the hard thing to do. And so-called enzyme design problems have been around since. And the, sequ uh, and the questions were formulated of how you designed and synthesized the catalyst that was not exist in the nature for so many years. Here, we want to rewrite the code of life which is composed, that, uh, composed of the DNA, they want to encode the protein that is something interesting. These are very difficult uh, problems. Um, first, the folding problems. How do we know that the sequence can encode the folded proteins? And second, which is the most important and what we care about is how this sequence encode the function. Due to the insufficient knowledge of the structure and function relationship. Unfortunately, and due to the increased amount of the investigations being carried out, uh, the protein engineers and the researchers have developed some kind of the uniform strategies. So, the first strategy that I would like to discuss is the rational design. Um, I believe that many of you should be familiar with this strategy because it is the earliest developed approach in protein engineering. So uh, the rational design is an in silico approach that required information on the amino acid sequence, uh, three-dimensional structure, catalytic mechanisms of the protein, protein data bank database, allows uh, that enables uh, the researchers to identify the hotspot that associated with the enzyme function. And following to that, the variants can be introduced using the site-directed mutagenesis. So the advantages of this strategy is it allows the researcher to rapidly identify uh, of the hotspot associated with the enzyme functions that may result in a limited number of the mutations that are required for screening. However, uh, the details of the structural knowledge of a protein is often not available. And even if it is available, it is very difficult to predict the effects of the various mutation. So here comes our second strategy, which is known as the directed evolution. It has been shown as a powerful tool for tailoring enzymes in the past two decades. So it mimics natural evolution process in vitro under appropriately controllable selective pressure for targeted purposes. So uh, the key principle of this approach is to construct a molecularly diverse library and to screen this library for mutations that improve the characteristics. The molecularly diverse library is established using the random mutagenesis method, that including the error-prone PCR, such as the use of a PFU tech polymerase and the DNA shuffling strategy. Now, this method allows the proteins modification in situations where information regarding the structure, 
and mechanisms of the target protein is unknown. But you know, this method uh, involves the several rounds of the evolution as well as to screen a large diverse library. And therefore, the entire workflow of directed evolution is time consuming and laborious. And the bottleneck is it requires a high throughput screening methodology. So um, here is a summary of the two approaches that I described earlier. So as shown, uh, the rational design using the method including the site-directed mutagenesis will require a range of the scientific knowledge of the protein structure. And using the bioinformatic tool to make the prediction, where specifically you can introduce the mutations using the method such as the site-directed mutagenesis in order to get your desired result. But the good thing is, it saves your screening effort. Um, on the other hand, uh, the directed evolutions, which use the random mutagenesis method, although less knowledge of the protein structure is required, uh, it is time consuming and laborious because out of probably uh, millions of the variants, the researchers will need to identify just one variant that has significant improvement. It is like finding a needle in a haystack. So because of this, uh, the scientists started to think of how can we make this directed evolution to be more efficient? So the scientists came up with an approach that combined the goods of the directed evolution and rational design, which is known as a semi-rational design. It is kind of in between because you still need a bit of information regarding to the protein structure, for example, the sequence, but it allows you at the same time to reduce the screening effort. And so we call this technology as a saturation mutagenesis. So uh, as you can tell from my previous slide that um, it is very important to have a well-constructed library that can be very helpful for and useful for protein and antibody engineer. Why is that? Just to imagine that you know, if you generate a library, and if you make a lot of mistakes, errors, deletions, truncations, then the researcher is actually dealing uh, with a library with an unwanted species. And if you have too many of the unwanted species, it will make you to have less wanted species in the library. And so this becomes very laborious to the researcher, not only in the time, but also uh, it is going to cost them a lot of the money because the screening method is not cheap. So uh, the researchers would use this library to tweak pretty much uh, anything that they want in the proteins and the antibodies in order to improve their performance. So for an example, uh, when the drug uh, is injected into the body and it reaches the target site and it binds very well to the target, we call this as a affinity maturations. And we can also uh, identify the critical residues within the protein domain. So that uh, if you want to see which residue is sensitive to the binding, uh, which is sensitive to the stability, so the researchers can create a library and making a change at a specific site and investigate the change of the performance. And also for therapeutic vector engineering. Well, this is a very difficult area because a lot of the modifications uh, will be involved, such as for AV engineering, because there are a lot of the engineers involved and also the modification involved to improve the target ability. But a lot of the time, the chances are you might lose some other ability, such as the transfection ability in other areas of the virus. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of the uh, case studies in the later part of my talk. So to generate the Milton library, Many of the researchers would probably use the in-house method, such as the degenerative mutant library, NNN or NNK. The challenge of using this approach is there is no way to eliminate the stop codon or unwanted codons. And uh, the advant uh, other, uh, this advantage is the researchers have no control on the amino acid ratio that incorporated uh, in each of the position. And when you couple the nucleotide, uh, each of the nucleotide have, will have the different couple efficiency. And because of this, uh, you will actually introduce the bias in the library. 
for examples, um, if the A to C has a higher couple efficiency, you will probably see a lot of a C's. So this is something that the researchers cannot control. So what all that means is the researchers has no control on the precise uh, on the uh, library design. Alternative, uh, alternatively, the researchers can consider the use of the trimer library. So what is the trimer library? Uh, the tr uh, these trimers are a pre-linked phosphoamidase which encodes each of the amino acids. So there are two different options that the, uh, the researchers can choose from. The standard trimer 20 or the trimer 19 can achieve an equal ratio of the amino acids and exclude the stop codons or cysteine. But uh, we still cannot choose the codons based on a specific host. Uh, or choose uh, the specific amino acid and it's very expensive. Alternatively, uh, the researchers can also uh, select a custom trimer mix, uh, which enables the researchers to, uh, to have a defined codon usage with a specific amino acid ratio. However, this mixture is extremely expensive and uh, it will take a longer time in order to, uh, for production. So uh, this slide basically to show how our P uh, Precision's Milton Library service different from the degenerative uh, Milton Library. So for example, if you have a goal to generate a Milton Library to optimize the taste of a milk from the cows, by using the degenerate library, uh, you create a library that gives you a lot of uh, species. But among this library, there are wanted, unwanted species, whereby with our technology, we are able to create one of the library types known as the saturation scanning library that enable to give the researchers all different type of the species without any uh, unwanted species. So this is to show that with our method, we have a precise control and the design. So uh, basically what the researchers ask for is what the customer get. So how can we do this? So uh, here comes to, uh, to our discussions on our uh, in-house technology, which is known as a semiconductor-based technology for oligosynthesis. So for this, uh, after the acquisitions of the custom array, we use the CMOS technology, which is a kind of the semiconductor technology that is used to make the computer chips, uh, the cell phones, and all kinds of the electronic devices. And this semiconductor chip we use is an array of hundreds of thousands of platinum electrodes which we synthesize the oligos on and can be used for Milton library construction. Each of these electrodes can be individually and precisely controlled by the computer software during the synthesis process. So with this technology, uh, we can proudly introduce that we are able to accelerate the pace of the research by making tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of oligos simultaneously and can be used as a molecular uh, diagnostic tool. So once the oligosynthesis process has completed, the oligos will be cleaved and pulled into the tube. So currently, GenScript has two different types of the chips. One is the 12K chip and another one is the 92K chip that allow us to synthesize up to uh, more than 12,000 oligos and 92,000 oligos respectively. So in a nutshell, What's unique about our oligosynthesis technology is it allows us to have a precise control and monitor synthesis in a closed chamber. And with this, we are able to avoid any of the variations from uh, the, uh, the change in the temperature or the humidity uh, that results in a good uniformity and almost 100% of the coverage, as well as the consistency between batches. So the picture here demonstrated a pool of the 12,000 unique oligos that's synthesized by the semiconductor array synthesis platform. And most importantly, this oligos shows the uniform distributions and uh, near 100% of the oligo coverage. So uh, additionally, we can synthesize thousands of oligos simultaneously. So we have a very quick turnaround times from the oligo synthesis uh, to begin the library constructions. So all of these advantages of this technology allow us to create a well-constructed Milton libraries 
for optimization of the proteins, the antibodies, and the therapeutic vector. Okay, so this slide shows how the, uh, the Precision Mutant Library uh, is made. So I'm now I'm going to walk you through uh, the process. So the variable regions of the customer designs, uh, which is shown in the orange color, is, uh, can be synthesized using the chip. So basically, the researcher will give uh, us a sequence of the proteins or the DNA template and say, OK, uh, I want to look at the CDR region, and I want to introduce uh, all 20 amino acids in a specific region. Then they will, uh, normally, uh, the researchers will define the positions for us. And then uh, the mutations that are introduced will be synthesized using the chip as, uh, that I introduced earlier. And then the constant regions will then be assembled with the regions with mutations. Basically, uh, we can deliver the PCR products of the mutated genes or the plasmid um, back to the researcher. So depending on the client's request, uh, we have three types of different libraries that are offered by GenScript, including the site saturation library, the saturation scanning library, and the combined natural mutant library. So if the researchers I uh, would like to introduce the amino uh, the mutation to at a specific site. Our site saturation library can fulfill the demand. Or if the clients do not know exactly where the hotspot is, we have the saturation scanning library that allows the client to introduce the amino acid across the regions that enable the researchers to scan for the hotspot. Or alternatively, when the researcher needs to mutate a consecutive positions one after another simultaneously and incorporate different ratio of the amino acid, our combined natural mutant library can fulfill the demand. And then all of these products will be validated using the NGS for the coverage. So now I'm going to walk you through uh, some of the case studies in order to let you know uh, how you may utilize this technology in your study. So in this first study that I showed, the researcher would like to optimize 38 residues that are located at the active sites of the enzymes that containing of uh, 484 amino acids. The objective of this project was to obtain the variant that improved the performance using the biochemical catalyst assay. These 38 amino acids were located at three different regions of interest in the DNA sequence. So what we did was we create the saturation scanning mutant library in which we mutate each of the amino acid site with 19 other amino acids. They're forming a total of 722 mutants at one time. And following to that, uh, those mutants were delivered in a single, pl uh, single plasmid mix pool. And finally, the NGS was used for coverage verification and codon distribution analysis. Here is the NGS data. Well, uh, just let me put my highlight, uh, the spotlight. Okay, so the clients has three regions of interest that was highlighted in three different colored. Um, and this is how much of the mutants that are expected. With our uh, with the NGS data shows that 100% of uh, the coverage for mutated species for all of the different regions. Right. So in addition, we look at the ratio of the amino acid at each site as well. And you can see that it was relatively equal distributions across all of the sites and there is no stop codon being introduced. So if you look at the average amino acid ratio at each of the mutated sites, uh, the deviations among different amino acids is quite small and constant. And this means that uh, the researcher need not to worry about picking a lot of the clones in order to see the full variation of the library as each of the variant is present in a relatively uh, equal amount. So the precision mutant library is also very useful for antibody engineering applications. For an example, to improve the substrate specificity, to optimize the stability, or for affinity maturation. In antibody engineering, 
uh, we often need to mutate multiple sites with particular amino acids based on the preliminary data and predicting modeling, especially in the CDR regions of the antibody, because here is where the binding occurs. Uh, in this case, uh, we created a combinatory mutagenesis library to improve the antibody affinity. So in this study, uh, the researcher aimed to mutate four sequential sites in the CDR regions of the antibody with a specific amino acid at desired position. For example, at the positions, uh, at the first positions, uh, it was uh, uh, it, uh, it was needed to mutate it with three different amino acids, and the second positions with ten different amino acids, and the third and fourth position need to mutate it with our 20 amino acids. So uh, with the NGS data, uh, we can show uh, that show on the right hand side that our amino acids are almost identical. And if you compare the deviations of the amino acid ratio they achieve from the design ratio, it is less than 25% in most sites. So this means that uh, each of the variants is present in a relatively equal amount. Additionally, the total expected mutant was about 12,000 uh, mutants, and our NGS data shows a near 92% uh, of the coverage that indicate uh, 11, 000, more than 11,000 of mutants have been created. So uh, our approach was also used, for compare, uh, used to compare with the traditional methodology of which the library was constructed with the NNK degenerative oligos. As you guys know that, uh, with this approach, uh, the researchers have no control with the mutated amino acid. And therefore, for the first two sites, you can see uh, the NNK method uh, unable to eliminate the unwanted amino acid, and the distributions was very, uh, uneven compared to uh, our mutant library. To look more closely, comparing the site number three and site number four, the deviations of the amino acid ratio from the designed ratio is huge in NNK library at 77.5% compared to the 12.5% that generated by using our in-house semiconductor-based technology. So uh, in the conclusions, uh, by using the semiconductor-based oligo, uh, it can eliminate the bias of amino acid distributions and therefore to increase the screening efficiency. So another example is to engineer the AAV capsid proteins to improve the performance of AAV vector. So this researcher already narrowed down to four sites of interest. And since uh, they intended to do a low throughput screening, the researcher would prefer to have a relatively small library size, but still exploring a good diversity of the mutants. So what they did was, they chose one amino acid from each of the seven types based on the amino acid property, such as the basic, uh, the acidic, the sulfur-containing, aromatic, and etc. And each of these four sites are mutated to seven different amino acids in a combinatorial way, and using the E. coli codon specifically. So the total number of mutants is about 2,401, and the variants were packed in the AAV plasmid and delivered as a single pool. So after the library is constructed, uh, we sequence all of the four positions and we detected uh, all of the mutations. That is 100% library coverage uh, of the desired variant. So in summary, by utilizing our semiconductor-based oligosynthesis technology in the constructions of mutant libraries, it allows us to have a precise control of a user-defined coding usage and a guarantee of more than 90% 90, 90 of coverage for the saturations libraries. And lastly, it allows us to create a large precise mutant library that saves the researchers from the time for screening. So before I end my presentations, I would like to put up this slide to emphasize that GenScript offers three different uh, mut uh, precisions mutant library types, including the site saturations mutagenesis, the saturation scanning mutagenesis, and the combinatorial mutant genesis library. And uh, you can go into this website for more detailed information. And here, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Edward, for the presentation.
So now we'll be answering some questions from the floor. Mm -hmm. The first question, what's the timeline and price range for each type of the library that you have mentioned? Um, actually, uh, the library constructions can be highly customized. So uh, each case can be varied a lot. Uh, the timeline for each of the different projects uh, need to be validated by our internal teams. So uh, I believe that it would be better for the researcher to send us uh, the request and have our experts to evaluate the projects to provide, uh, uh, to provide the researcher with the cost effective library type and the shortest turnaround time. Thank you, Dr. Edward. So the next question, uh, how are the libraries supplied? Um, well, uh, there are two different options. Uh, if the client need a PCR product as a de uh, deliverable, uh, the GenScript can provide the purified PCR amplicons in a liquid form, and the total amounts will be depends on the length of the amplicons. In general, uh, as far as I know, um, GenScript can provide up to a few hundred nanograms for the PCR product uh, to the researcher. Alternatively, if uh, the final clones is the final deli uh, deliverable, GenScript will prepare about uh, 10 micrograms of the plasmid in a liquid form and will also provide a one mil of the glycerol stock as well. So, okay. in, uh, have I been here? so in general, uh, the GenScript will advise the clients to order the plasmid from us before the cloning. Uh, could have introduced uh, uh, because the cloning could have introduced the bias that would affect the ultimate results. Therefore, uh, it would be better for us to handle. Okay, thank you, Dr. Edward. So the next question, uh, does it have the limit of the library size? What's the maximum library size? Uh, uh, yes, uh, we, we do have the limit in the library size. Um, for the clone library, uh, the library size will be dependent on uh, several aspects, including the, the copy number of the plasmid of uh, the researcher choice and also the size of the final construct. So generally, uh, the researchers are, uh, so I mean, GenScript are able to achieve a library of approximately 10 to the power of 6 to 10 to the power of 7 uh, using high copy number of the plasmid. And uh, when necessarily, uh, GenScript can try to scale up uh, from 10 to the power of 7 to 10 to, 10 to the power of 8. But uh, that's the maximum that GenScript can achieve. So if the researcher would prefer the PCR as a final product, uh, the maximum may reach 10 to the power of 11. Okay, thank you, Dr. Edward. So the next question, uh, why shouldn't I use rational diversity where I can screen large number of random mutants? What's the percentage of coverage will you achieve? Okay, so there are two questions here. So uh, the first question, um, but there are a few number of uh, reasons. Uh, because you, uh, you already know certain amino acid substitutions will disturb the function of the proteins. Um, for example, uh, the, cyst uh, the cysteine in the CDR regions of the, uh, of the antibody candidates, or the possible variants of a proteins uh, can be astronomically high that exceed the capacity of even the highest throughput screening capability uh, by many orders of the magnitude. So uh, the fewer useless uh, mutations, such as those that are occurring in less important regions uh, of a proteins, or uh, that can cause the frame shift or stop coding, the better the chance to finding the variant that results in a desired phenotype. And uh, it can also, uh, because some screening methods are time consuming and laborious, Therefore, screening fewer clones can save the time and the money. So uh, the, the, the second question is about what percentage of the coverage will be achieved. So uh, as you can see from my slide that uh, in general, we can ensure to achieve a greater than 90% of the coverage using the NGS. Uh, our existing clients are satisfied with what we could have achieved. And this is actually uh, what we are proud of using our sophisticated system uh, and the great depth of the experts behind uh, in GenScript. But uh, as shown in my case studies, uh, we are trying our best to achieve 100% uh, of the coverage. Okay, thank you, Dr. Edward. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question, how do you analyze amino acid deviation in the graph? Uh, okay, 
uh, this is um, analyzed by, by our internal uh, internal team. So uh, I I'm unable to give such information. But uh, you know, uh, after the end of my talk, uh, I can uh, well reply to the, the answers after I get a reply from uh, our internal team. Okay, thank you. So the next question. How do you ensure a unique sequence while doing the PCR rather than one anticon dominating in the PCR pool? Okay, uh, actually, you know, uh, as I mentioned, um, all of this uh, uh, oligos is actually um, individually and also uh, being uh, precisely monitored uh, using the software. And therefore, um, uh, okay, therefore, all of these oligo, uh, all, all of these oligos are actually uh, accu uh, are all accurate. But uh, you are right. You know, during the PCR, um, there were, uh, we will probably introduce some of the bias. And therefore, uh, when you, uh, when, if you look back at my uh, the presentations, um, some uh, in one of the cases we are unable to achieve uh, the hundred percent of the coverage and only ninety percent that we achieve. So we are trying to improve the technology in order to. Um, well, to minimize uh, the PCR bias. Okay, thank you, Dr. Edward. So the next question, uh, could you repeat on the combinatorial library part? I'm sorry, what's the question about? Uh, can you repeat on the combinatorial library part? To repeat? Like on it? Yeah. Uh, like when you say further repeat, in, repeat in terms of? Oh, um, Maybe further explain. Yeah. Because um, some of them uh, couldn't catch it. Oh, okay. So um, so let me get back to the slide. Okay. So I basically, uh, I think it's for this one. Right. So basically, um, for this combinatorial mutant library, uh, it allows uh, the clients, uh, the researchers, to have the um selections in order to mutate multiple sites uh, at, uh, simultaneously at the same um, simultaneously. So uh, with this, um, like the case that I show you, uh, in this case, uh, the researcher would like to uh, mutate this four sequential site with a specific uh, amino acids. So, um, you know, uh, this, for example, at this first site, uh, at the, uh, the first site, the researcher would like to introduce three different of the amino acids and second site with uh, 10 different amino acids and the third and fourth with 20 amino acids. So uh, by using, uh, if, you, if you use a traditional mutant library, it's uh, impossible to do so as I mentioned because uh, the NNN or NNK will actually create uh, a lot of unwanted species. So by we, uh, with the use of our uh, technology, we are able to precisely and individually control um, the Amino as uh, the mutates uh, mutations that int may introduce into the uh, into the position. Okay, thank you, Dr. Edward. So, due to time constraint, we will end the Q and A session here. For those questions that we didn't get to answer just now, I will email the answers from Dr. Edward back to you. So, thank you, Dr. Edward, for the presentation, and also to all of you who joined us today. I hope you find this session useful and beneficial. So thank you for joining us again and have a nice day. Thank you.